thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, thank you, James, for uh, inviting me to give this talk. So today I'm going to focus more on the uh, process base uh, rather than uh, a lot of modeling, because there are other talks uh, during this uh, uh, conference. Uh, so what I have here is uh, uh, some research that we are uh, doing in South America. So we are going to go from a cold region to a little bit uh, tropical region. It's in uh, Peru. Uh, here, so since we are going to talk about morphodynamics, let me show you what kind of morphodynamic platform features that we have in the Amazon region. So just to locate yourself, this is uh, the Marañón River, and this is the Ucayali River, and this is uh, the, uh, uh, the Amazon River, where it's born in a city called Nauta. Nauta is somewhere here. So, and uh, one of the largest cities in Peru is uh, called Iquitos, which is right there. So basically, uh, the, my point of, let's say, the, my uh, full of, uh, field study is in this region uh, uh, for now. So the Marañón River is an anabranching channel. As you can see here, uh, well, there is also the Amazon River that is an anabranching channel. So basically, what is an anabranching channel or system is when you have a, a, a main channel with additional secondary channels, which is kind of different from a truly meandering or less uh, meandering channel, which only has one uh, single thread uh, channel. So the dynamics are different, and we have shown that the dynamics of the meandering channels are more, uh, let's say, the uh, rate of migration are higher than the anabranching systems. So, but these two systems exist, coexist in the same region. So I have to show this uh, visualization, one of the best that I have uh, seen, just to illustrate how a meandering channel uh, evolves. So you have a flat plane, and then you have a single thread channel that migrates, depending on the uh, morphodynamic and hydrodynamic condition, it will migrate uh, in, in, in hundreds or thousands of years. So what is interesting from this uh, illustration is that meander channels migrate, and then they have to cut themselves. Basically, the, uh, the cutoffs will happen in order to have kind of a dynamic equilibrium. So this river itself, it does, if there is no change in the tectonics or geological settings or anything, this river will try to get a dynamic equilibrium condition. So and let me show you what I think is a conceptual model for uh, a bend that is going to uh, migrate. So we have, this is a plan for view 1A, V, and C2. And this is the profile view. So basically, let's assume that this, this initial channel is under equilibrium condition. So basically, the slope that you see here is, an equilibrium, uh, is under equilibrium condition. So if the river starts to migrate, let's say in these two bands, A, B, and B, C, start to migrate, what is going to happen is that the distance between A and B, of course, is going to be longer. So you will have a reduced reduction in the slope. Same for BC here. So what is going to happen is, well, C2 is the same because nothing has migrated. Let's assume that nothing has migrated. So we have now difference in the slope of the meandering setting. So we have an initial equilibrium condition that right now we have a different equilibrium condition. So a different stage. So basically, the, the question is how the river will try to go back to this equilibrium condition. If there is no increase on sediment transport here, uh, there, is a, there is no more load of sediment, either suspended or bed low, this will take a long time to reach, let's say, to deposit all this uh, flat plane and get you know, a parallel uh, slope to the initial condition. However, so basically what we have here is a depositional system. However, if we go back and illustrate a conceptual model for a cutoff, Again, one A, B, and two. So, and this, let's assume that this setting is also under equilibrium condition. This is the slope here. So if A and B are, uh, there, there is a cutoff here, a bend is, uh, let's say, abandoning this area, is abandoning this uh, ridge. So what is going to happen is that B will be closer to A, so basically you have an increase on the slope. Uh, from B to 2 is the same slope, so it's parallel to the blue line, to the, to the original blue line. So the question is how the river now goes, try to go, go back to the uh, equilibrium condition. So in this case, it's much easier because 
If let's assume that the dash yellow line is the equilibrium condition that is going to try to reach the, the, the river. So in this case, what is going to happen, you will have a wave, an erosional wave going traveling farther upstream and a depositional wave traveling farther downstream. So by the combination of these very simplified conceptual models, a rain migration and a cutoff, you will have, let's say, the equilibrium condition that any river my uh, my 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 do so and um, if we see large systems like the Ucayali River, this is the tributary one of the main tributaries of the Amazon River. Remember the Ucayali and the Marañón form the uh, Amazon River. So this is the Ucayali farther upstream from the confluence, but. You can see here, this is a picture from 1975, 96, and 2010. 1975, you can see that there is a bend here, bend one, two, and, and then a three, and more or less four. In 1996, you don't have these bends. So basically, this system, at least in this area, is, try, is uh, developing more erosional, uh, let's say, waves traveling upstream and the positional wave traveling downstream. Again, erosional waves will do is, what will do is produce a straightening of the ridge. And you can see here, the, ri the ridge, at least in this area, is, is more like a straight channel. However, somewhere in 1998, you have here the kind of a complex bend, let's say three uh, com uh, consecutive bends that was cut here. You can see in the, uh, 2010, this bend does not exist anymore. So you have a huge cutoff here. So again, if you have a cutoff upstream, you will have erosional process straightening of the channel. And you can see here, you have a meander channel here. And in 2010, due to this cutoff of this bend that is downstream, you don't have, I mean, you are reducing the sinuosity or the amplitude of this bend. So now, at least in this area, the, the process is more uh, erosional, but I show you from 19, 1975 to at least 2000, uh, to 1996, this whole area was going under erosional, more cutoffs. And look, look here now, in 2010, the river is trying to go back to the equilibrium condition by migrating or increasing the rate of migration. So basically, the, uh, the amplitude of these bands here are increasing. So by this combination of cutoffs and migration, this river will try to reach, again, the equilibrium condition. And, and if we perform, a, let's say, a power spectrum analysis on, based on the channel center line, you can see that for the Ucayali River in this area, it's around 25 kilometers, the wavelength, the dominant wavelength, given the sinuosity of the uh, channel, 1.7. So what we did, uh, uh, this year is uh, we went to this area that is uh, near Pucallpa. It's a big city there in, uh, in the Peruvian Amazon area. And we have done single beam measurements. So basically, we, we get the bathymetry in this area right here. It's around 25 to 30 kilometers long. The channel uh, width is somewhere 800 meters. And you can see here the, this, uh, uh, the, the solutions, basically the measurements. You have a depositional region at the inner band, erosional region in the outer band, here the blue color. So basically here the coloring are showing uh, pink are, L L let's say, uh, uh, the positional areas, and blue are erosional areas. So this is a typical configuration for a meander. You can see here also downstream, the position and erosion in the outer band. So, the, the key question here is, these large systems, as you can see, they have the old traces. I mean, these were abandoned channels. Uh, th this whole system has small channels that are connecting these, these, uh, these uh, uh, large uh, channels. So now the, the city that is located there, it has more uh, population. And it's, uh, the, the, the linkage between the city, the population, people, and the, the river, it's stronger now. Why? Because they all depend on the commerce based on the river, if they can navigate. And also, they depend on all the water intake and outflows into the river. So they are, let's say, con uh, concerned about if the river will migrate and get away from the city of Pucallpa. So that's what we were trying to do here, understand the dynamics of the Ucayali River near the city 
First, we did some uh, bathymetric measurements, and then we have done is uh, ADCP measurements. We have done every, uh, the, we have several cross sections in, the, uh, in this area, and this is just one of them near the, the city here. You can see outside of this bend, and you can see that the velocities are higher in the outer band. These are the average velocities, and this is the cross-sectional uh, section here. The cross-section here showing, again, also in the water column, where you can expect higher velocities. These are the stream-wise velocity uh, contours. So, Again, you have a scour region near the outer band, so typical behavior of a meandering channel. Here. So what we are trying to do is, we have done, uh, at least uh, I have uh, been working for a few years in meandering channels, mostly for the laboratory, laboratory experiments and modeling for a lab scale. And uh, this is a challenge now, that we are trying to model a large river, this is the Ucayali again, 25, 35 kilometers long. And uh, right now we are concentrating on validating our modeling. So basically, we, have, we are using a 2D modeling for now. We also uh, plan to use later on a 3D model. But for now, 2D model, in order to, to uh, validate our measurements, and I mean, our modeling with our measurements. So the idea is then what we can do is develop the morphodynamic model and try to predict the evolution of this uh, meandering configuration. Again, let's go back to, uh, to, the, uh, to the conference of the Amazon here, the Marañón and the Ucayali River. So we have seen a little bit about the Ucayali River. Now let's look a little bit about the Amazon River. Again, Amazon River is born right here. Again, the Amazon River is not a meandering channel. It's an, an branching structure, main channel, and secondary channels. If we see the, uh, let's say, this is a starting, this is Nauta, where the Amazon is born, this is uh, Iquitos, and this is going through Brazil, Brazil. so basically, uh, 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 this is the boundary between Peru and Brazil. So if we identify the anabranching structures, again, what I'm calling anabranching structure is a main channel with secondary channels. If we identify along this uh, flat plane, we can see here in these uh, yellow circles where you, you are uh, observing anabranching structures. The interesting thing is that, for example, here, let's pick this one. You have a high sinuosity channel, let's say local sinuosity, but still you have secondary channels. Let's pick this one here. You have very low sinuosity of the main channel, and still you do have secondary channels. And here, for example, this one is a, uh, let's say, medium sinuosity, and you still have secondary channels. The question is, how many secondary channels can we expect, either a low, let's say, medium or high sinuosity of the main channel? How are they produced? This is an erosional system. Basically, there is, uh, this is not like the Parana River, where uh, the, the, is, the, the Parana is still in a depositional system. So here, the dynamics of these secondary channels might be important for the dynamics of the whole anabranching system. So that's what we are trying to do, uh, uh, trying to understand, let's say, what kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, what is the importance of these secondary channels on the dynamics of each anabranching structure, and why is, uh, how is that important in order to understand the whole Amazon system? So let's focus on in only one here. This is the uh, Muyui area. This is near Iquitos. Here you can see there uh, Iquitos uh, city. So this is clear. You have a main channel right there, and secondary channel and a small, let's say, secondary channel. But let's consider only two secondary channels here for simplifying things. From 1987 to 2009, if you compare the, the images, maybe things might not, might not change too much, right? Uh, you can see that the, the whole anabranching structure is more stable. However, if you see here, and I don't have the images here, for example, when you have this high sinuosity main channel, the dynamics are quite similar to a meandering channel. So basically, it's the rate of migration for this and a branching structure is higher than the rate of migration for this other one. So 
Let's go back here to Muyui. However, if we see uh, in detail here, okay, the main channel does not migrate too much because it may be stabilized by these secondary channels. However, these secondary channels, you can see here, this is in IT7, this secondary channel is starting to develop like a, its amplitude. It's starting to migrate somewhere here. And in uh, 2005, it already merged with this other secondary uh, channel. So basically, the, the, the message here is that we can treat these anabranching structures as is the composition of a main channel and secondary channels that are quasi uh, freely meandering channels. Basically, non-developed meandering channels. And why do I, what do I mean by that? You have a boundary condition here upstream, at least for these secondary channels. You have boundary conditions given by the anabranching structure, and also you do have a downstream boundary condition. It's not like in the case of uh, let's say a freely meandering channel when, let's, let's go back uh, here. In a case of a freely meandering channel that the upstream boundary condition is farther upstream and there, let's say in this case, there is no, uh, let's say, uh, uh, force in downstream, no boundary condition that is uh, modifying the structure. So you allow the river to migrate along the flat plane, develop this dynamic equilibrium, get the uh, dominant wavelengths, get the dominant amplitudes, get the dominant uh, migration rates, all these parameters, statistical parameters. However, for the case of the, uh, for the case of the uh, anabranching structure here, you don't have the opportunity, you don't let these meandering channels to develop. So they are non-developed and they are not freely meandering because they interact with other channels, and they also have the placement of the all, let's say, the magnet. You can see here all traces. So it's not the same as, as, uh, as, the, as those as, uh, freely meandering channels. So what we have seen here is, again, meandering channels, purely meandering channels migrate much faster than anabranching channels. And you can see here, this is a meandering channel that the migration rate is much higher than, let's say, it, it's much higher than the whole structure. So, but still, we need to understand under what conditions. Here, this is more stable. And this is important, at least for uh, management, because this is the Amazon River. Brazil is somewhere here, is trying to get to, to Asia through the Amazon River, going to, to uh, uh, trying to, uh, let's say, go to Peru and get to the Pacific Ocean and then go to Asia there, spe specifically to China. So this is going to become very important. And a lot of, let's say, uh, a, a hydraulic structures or uh, other kind of civil structure will be built somewhere in this region. So people might think that this is a very stable and a branching structure, but the idea is uh, to understand the dynamics of each of these and branching structures because the question is why do we have this 30 kilometer wavelength of pres the, the, the presence of these and branching structures? That's something that we don't know. And uh, at least my, my group is trying to understand that. So again, we have done two field campaigns in this area. Uh, 2010 and 2011, uh, but in 2010 we have used uh, uh, multi-beam and single beam here. But this is the single beam data uh, for this uh, for different anabranching structures. Here I'm only showing you for the Muyu area. You can see this is water depth, so this is not uh, bed elevation. So higher water depth, more scoured region. Lower water depth is the depositional region. So you can see here for the main channel. Typical erosional uh, uh, region here. In let's consider this is a vent. Outside of the vent, let's consider this is a higher erosional region. Outside of the vent, higher erosional region. It behaves like a big, big meander. So if we change the contours here, at least the scale, and just look at the individual secondary channels, like this one here, it's interesting because you start to see a typical meander. You see here, uh, in this case, water depth again, erosional region in the outer bank, erosional region in this outer bank changes. So you start to see, uh, 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 let's say, development of this bend. 
What is I interesting here is look at the colors. Here, the, the, the erosional region is more or less pink, but here it's more white. So basically, which means is that this meander is trying to develop higher and higher erosional rates or erosional, let's say, scour uh, power, to, uh, power to scour the, 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 the bed farther downstream. But it cannot do it you know, as, as a freely meander because you have the influence of the downstream boundary condition. So let's look at another one here. Again, typical meander configuration. Upstream in this area, in the outer bank, red colors, erosional region. Here, pink colors, erosional region. And this is showing what I have said. Downstream, the farther downstream that you are in these non-developed uh, uh, channels, the higher the erosional rate. So what, what it's telling us is that uh, let's say we need to understand the dynamics of this in order to understand the dynamics of the whole uh, anabranching structure. And you can see here clearly the inflection point, basically from one bank, from the outer bank of this band to the outer bank of the other band. Again, these are single beam data. We were playing with the multi beam data in order to get the bed morphology, basically bed forms in this anabranching structure, because that's another question. How about the bed forms in these non-developed secondary channels? How are they compared to the main channel? For example, if we have dunes, how are they compared? So that's something we are, are doing. Also, we have, we have done a lot of ADCP measurements in different places, but I'm showing you right here just to give the message. Typical meandering configuration. Higher velocity, these are, again, depth average velocities, higher velocity the outer band, changes to the other outer bank. So these are not the typical, uh, let's say, I always play with more freely meandering channels. These are not the typical ones, and we need to understand these non-developed uh, uh, scenarios. Let's talk a little bit about what kind of morphodynamic, uh, bed morphodynamic features that we encounter. So this go back, goes back to uh, my uh, research when I uh, was at the University of Illinois. Where we have developed this. Uh, Kinoshita channel, and I have measured some uh, uh, dunes migrating along this high sinuosity channel. You can see here uh, uh, at different hours. You can see this, um, this is an animation at different hours, so where dunes were migrating along this high amplitude uh, meander. So you can expect that dunes are migrating, maybe modifying the flow structure. The question is, how much do they modify? How much, how important are those bed forms in order to uh, consider for long-term meandering migration? So this is a time equal one hour. You can see one bed form here. This is a dune, right? What I have done is we have measurements at each hour, and we have uh, uh, computed a flow structure using a three-dimensional fully navier stock uh, model. So we are, I'm showing you here is cross-section 15, cross-section 16, right here. 15 is the apex of the bend here. You more or less, these are the velocity, what you're observing here is just the cross-sectional velocity. So more or less, you recover what is the secondary flow, right? We, we have learned from uh, uh, fluvial uh, mechanics like 101 that Near the uh, surface, flow goes to the outer bank, and near the bed, flow goes to the inner bank. That's why you have a depositional region in the inner bank. And you more or less recover that here, this secondary flow or this helical motion. However, if you are in cross-section 16, right there, you have a presence of a dune. You can see there. And these are not two-dimensional dunes. These are three-dimensional dunes. And if you plot the vectors, at least from the simulations, we, we uh, couldn't measure uh, completely when we have uh, progressive wave because uh, dunes because you know you can you have to have at the statistic at least uh, three minutes or five minutes of measurement so and the bed forms were migrating so but using this uh, three-dimensional model we describe here that there is no secondary flow so it's almost the opposite look at this near the surface going inward so what does it mean this is that the presence of this three-dimensional dune is modifying the secondary flow, the natural secondary flow. And why is this important? If we go to the field, let's say to the Ucayali River, if we have dunes that are, depending on the dimension, of course, 
whatever you measure, you might be able, you, if you measure, let's say, in this condition, you will say, oh, we didn't observe the natural secondary flow. But that may be wrong, because it is. The secondary flow is there, but it's being modified by the boundary layer above this dune. So that's what we need to consider that, that you know, what kind of bed forms do we have in the, in the channel is what we need to consider. And uh, if we compare, uh, how many minutes do I have? Two? OK. So if we compare, let's say, this is an instantaneous value with, like, say, a time average bed morphology. This is just the bank, shear stresses on the bank, the outer bank. You can see here, if you have a dune, you have high shear stresses compared to a, let's say, a steady condition. So basically, most of the morphodynamic models, that, uh, at least what I have worked, we consider only the steady condition and not the instantaneous values that for shear stresses. And depending, of course, on the bed morphology, you may have high shear stresses, higher fluvial erosion. And that's what something we are doing. One of my students is trying to characterize these bed forms, separating dunes and ripples and, uh, for uh, large river systems. And the, my other student is trying to do is trying to understand the flow structure. At least this is for a laboratory scale. You can see this is in millimeters. But at least what we want to do is understand this bed form interaction with the flow structure and see if that's important for long-term migration or not. So with that, I want to finish just saying this. We have a, a GIS-based long-term uh, migration model that uh, we initially worked uh, you know, back in the day, 2006, it was uh, part of my master thesis. Now we have improved a lot with the help of uh, Eddie Langendun from the USDA, and we have some cap capabilities for bank erosion, physically based bank erosion model. So it, this is the website, and we, are, we will be contacting the, uh, in order to put this into the CSDM uh, uh, website. So. Again, just want to finish. I have to acknowledge without this uh, support from these uh, agencies and from specifically the Peruvian Navy that they are, uh, we, are, uh, we have an agreement with them. Uh, basically, these field campaigns will be uh, impossible and well, my students and the support from my university. So thank you so much. Thank you. Questions? No question? Yes, yeah. yes, just one small question on the 3D flow field you showed on the, on the dune in the river band. I was very surprised by, by, by the strong velocity upwards near the bed. Do you have any explanation so, on that? Yes. So basically, that cross section. That cross section is located at almost the tip of the bed form when you have you know flow more like a developing shear layer going to the free surface so that's the location that's 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 uh, I don't know if I can go here here you can see here so this dune we have the development boundary layer right there, and because the flow is accelerating that's why you have these vectors going up. So if we go, let's say, for a, just a simple, simple configuration, let's say, you have a, if you don't consider two bed forms, only one, I mean, the, always you will have a shear layer right here, correct? So that's, that's what we are showing in the other simulations. I don't know if that answers the uh, question. Well, we can look into the boundary yeah. conditions. You know, you assume uh, the vertical velocity to be Zero. No, in 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 but these are large edit, yeah, these are large edit simulation, but this one were uh, more runs, so we were putting like a logarithmic, uh, uh, let's say, uh, wall functions into this uh, in the bed, at least in uh, in this uh, simulation. These were done uh, because the, of the domain we were modeling the whole three uh, consecutive bands in this case. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I'm I'm curious to know. That when you are doing modeling, you must be measuring uh, the f flow, river flow, and the sediment uh, discharge, right? Yes. How many, uh, 
How many places, how many locations? Oh, we have, at least for the Amazon region, we have, I mean, we are covering the entire Amazon, the Peruvian Amazon, up to our boundary with Brazil. And uh, the Navy is trying to get an agreement with the Brazilian Navy in order to get more, or let's say, go, go into the Brazilian side also. And uh, so here is what I want to acknowledge is that this is not only Peruvian Navy and University of Pittsburgh. We have other institutions. That's why we created this uh, center that is CREAR. It's a Spanish uh, word that means create. So basically, we will be doing you know, long-term monitoring of this uh, region. And if we are talking about also sharing data, that's also that we are trying to do. Maybe in the future, we can put all our measurements for other people that want to do more uh, analysis on that.